As part of the Open University of Hong Kong's Open and Innovative Education Week, Professor Robert Tennyson conducted a workshop on enhancing computer-based instruction in higher education with applied psychological research and theory. Professor Tennyson is an eminent scholar from the Department of Educational Psychology at the University of Minnesota, as well as editor-in-chief of the journal Computers in Human Behavior. In the workshop, he explained how principles of psychology can be applied to the instructional design of courses, with a particular focus on educational technology. To start with, the use of instructional theory and technology is not new. In fact, we can go back in our uh, history, um, and I'm just giving a couple of examples. And this is a, an American psychologist slash philosopher, John Dewey, and he envisioned a linking science between learning theory and educational practice. So right at the, this is, I have a date up here, 1910, 100 years ago. He was proposing that there be a, a link between the theorist in the laboratory and what is happening in the classroom. So Don Dewey, his idea was that what I'm talking about is something that can be practical in the classroom. He's had a big impact on education and this notion of linking science. Okay, another, and I'm pointing these out just because I want to say 100 years ago we were talking about it. Edward Thorndike was a, an American psychologist who did a lot of research uh, on behavior and trying to help people learn. A lot of his work was done early on with uh, cats. But what's wrong with cats? Well, once they get a certain age, they don't want to do anything. You know, while they're young and hungry, they'll do a lot of things. But they won't. So he tried to then transfer to humans, and I'm just pointing out here his law of effect and exercise up here. That if students during instruction, during learning, if they have positive experiences, they'll probably do it again. So one of the ideas in online courses is that you have an opportunity for students to have success, to show that they are making progress and they'll want to come back. One of the big problems early on in extension courses and online courses is the large dropout rate. Getting, if you start with 100 students, maybe only 50 finish. Well, that is not a good situation, okay? And I, myself, hate incompletes. We call them incompletes in the United States. That's at the end of the term, and there's students who haven't finished. So the law of effect is to help students achieve success during the course, so that law, they will keep in the process, the hard work of learning. The other is exercise. And exercise is a, is a uh, call it best practices. You, learning, I'll say this, because all of us are educators, learning is hard work. And so exercise is to help students learn by repetition or doing work by doing assignments, by completing things on time. And so th what Thorndike was doing was he said, okay, these two laws are very important in education. So in the practice of teaching then, he said these are two valuable, uh, important parts of designing instruction. Okay, I point this out to show that, the, and I started with, there's a link between psychology and classroom learning. Okay, the next one here, I call it the promise of technology. For a long time, for starting at the end of the 19th century, when technology was moving 
towards the general public, technology was to be the panacea. Do you know what that term is? The panacea is the solution to all our problems. Students will really learn in the classroom with technology. So that was the promise. And if we look at the date here, Thomas Edison, 1900. That was over 100 years ago. Thomas Edison, a well-known American inventor, one of the things he invented was film. He was so excited about film. This was before sound, but just film. He said that film would make a systemic change in educational instruction. We do use technology. We call it multimedia now or media education. Uh, but we still are looking for that promise that in education still, we've done a lot of evaluation on our courses and we found that part-time students really like to interact with other students and teachers, okay? The real impact of technology has been on full-time students who view uh, a lot of the online computer-based courses like I teach. They like those because it's an alternative. And there's some more recent developments. The internet has been around a long time. Okay, it started out as a project uh, in, the, in the Army Research Institute in uh, Washington, D.C. It was called the Packet Network. They wanted a way in which uh, they could quickly communicate, and when I say they, the military could com uh, communicate quickly. So in the 1950s started the concept and the development of the Internet. I'm just pointing out some other developments along the way. Seymour Papert in the 1980s uh, promoted what's called micro worlds. Now, I know we don't use that word too much anymore, but micro worlds during the 80s and 90s was the big computer based where people will, uh, especially children, will learn. And he developed a software language called Logo. Logo doesn't mean anything unless you're Greek. Because logo itself is the Greek word for word. But some people keep thinking, well, maybe it stands for something, some like language of general something or other, or trying to figure out what the acronym for logo is. Logo is just a Greek word, okay? It has no other meaning than that. But Seymour Papert had a... Uh, some of you may know the background of Seymour Papert, his software. He developed a turtle, what's called a turtle, a little character that students would sit in front of that TV, or TV, not TV, in front of their computer screen, and the logo, they'd give them problems, and they would try to uh, figure out how to make this turtle do different uh, intelligent things. So he was promoting Logo as the panacea for education. Okay, a couple of other people here. Another, in contrast, was a uh, engineer, electrical engineer at the University of Illinois, Bitzer, who developed what was called Plato. Now, Plato does stand for something besides the Greek uh, philosopher. It's the program logic for automated teaching operations. Now, I don't know if, it, probably none of you are that old to remember Plato. There is still a corporation that sells educational software called Plato, but Plato was a hardware software device. It was to have a TV screen, it could show slides, and it was also a computer terminal. And it was also connected by a telephone line through what was called a modem. We rarely use that term anymore, but there's a thing, a modem. You dialed up on your phone, you put it in a modem, and students could interact. 
Okay, the last one here I have is an example. Back in the 1990s, the big word was artificial intelligence. Okay, we would develop programs that could take the student's model of their, what they needed, and then the program would adjust the instruction to the unique needs of that student. Okay, that's the application of intelligent tutoring systems. I don't think we try to do that anymore. It's, not only is it so complex to try to individualize the instruct, instruction to the student, but it, it, uh, the, the cost was prohibitive. But I point this out, in case you're interested, Collins and Brown were promoting this um, idea of intelligent tutors. Let's get up to a, maybe our current situation, okay? What are we doing um, in terms of software that, is, that instructors can use? Now, one example I have here is Moodle. I have a course that I teach, Instructional Psychology and Technology, which I use Moodle as a totally online course, okay? It does not have any face-to-face. -face. Students sign up. The only constraints is that we schedule our courses the same as face-to-face -face courses. Starts on a given day, ends on a given day. Now, another system which is gaining some worldwide promise are the MOOC courses, your massive open online courses. And various universities throughout the world have attempted to use these uh, MOOC courses where they get hundreds and hundreds of students signing up for a course. It makes a lot of money. The problem is most of the students never finish the course. But the tuition is collected, so it makes administrators happy that we have the money. But there's such a high level of incomplete. It's a new area that needs you know, a lot of uh, attention to, a lot of evaluation, So, because you want students to finish. I mean, you don't want them just to start and then drop out. And also the format of the MOOC was kind of, I'd say, primitive in that all you did is the professors standing up here talking and they're showing the video and students are taking the course that way. I mean, that's very, it's relatively inexpensive, that kind of course. But uh, it's gaining popularity. Uh, it, it has some of the features of online courses. It can have some interaction with students if you break down the location that students can go to uh, uh, meet face to face. So there's a lot of possible flexibility with these courses. But there, it, I'm bringing it up, and some of you are familiar with them. Uh, it's an alternative format uh, for students to take these kinds of courses. I'm not sure it's the promise of technology, as I started earlier, but it is a continuation of development. This is a very controversial uh, statement. I don't know if you've ever seen this statement by Richard Clark. It's been around a while, but I'll give you a chance to read it here because it's, he's raised a very important question and it's still a big debate in using media. And when I say media, computers or video. So he's saying the media is just like a delivery truck that brings groceries to the store. Now, whether or not it changes the nutrition, the truck doesn't make that decision. So he's arguing, and Richard, I've known him for a long time. He's at the University of Southern California. But this quote, and I think as professors sometimes they say, is there something that uh, I can say that will be the highlight of my career? And I think he did this in 1980 sometime. So we still quote it today, and, uh, so, and Richard Clark is still the person who raised the question in one sentence. 
Now, some other, relate, some other people who worked on the relationship, one is a Robert Gagné, who is no longer alive, but he was an early uh, developer of, and I'm gonna show his, uh, what he calls events of instruction. Then I threw my name up there, because I'm here. So I'm gonna do it, so anyhow, that's kinda nice. I'm not sure if you've seen this list, but Robert Gagné calls this the events of instruction. So he's saying good instruction should have these nine events. So we can take some time to just look at those. And I think they transfer also to designing computer-based instruction. These nine events, although originally he was talking about in the general sense of what good instruction should have. So when you're looking at designing computer-based instruction, these nine events still are valuable uh, as part of that uh, process. And this is starting with gaining the attention of the student, inform the students of the objectives, so you tell them, okay, what the course is about, what we're gonna be doing in that course, this next one is obviously important, stimulating recall of prior knowledge. So they say, okay, we want to, in, from a cognitive psychology point of view, we want to make a relationship between what you currently have, current knowledge, with the new information. Okay, presenting the content, and that's part of the, with computing or however you're going to present it. Guidance, okay, so the students know what they're doing. There's done a lot of evaluation where students kind of get lost. When I talked about that early Plato system, one of the main complaints was students would get lost in the system. Okay, they wouldn't know exactly where to go. Okay, eliciting performance, as I said before, getting students the law of effect. Have them do something so they can get feedback that they're actually using that knowledge. Okay, feedback we've talked about. Assessing performances. Uh, this is simply students would like to know the progress they're making. So when I do my courses, I evaluate each assignment and tell them if they're in that assignment what level of performance they were doing. Then they can gauge their progress. Rather than saying good work or this is well done, you're a little bit more specific about what they've done well, where they need to make improvements. So feedback is probably a psychological term that's been around for 100 years. Okay, giving students feedback. And computers are, can be very good at that. Okay, and then the last one here, enhancing retention and transfer. That's what education is all about. Students are, go through a course, they've learned that information, they can use that information, and they can transfer it to new situations. So a college degree is going to be valuable 10 years from now, 20 years from now, because of this being able to transfer to new things that come along. In any, in any profession, or is that transfer of thing. Now I put my own name up there, and this is a complex little model, so I don't, given our time here, I'm not gonna go through in detail, but it's, it's a model that's trying to link, that's kind of a message I'm talking about today, linking our knowledge of psychology with what we do when we present a course, design a course. And there's certain things that going down the left side here that are valuable. Basically, we, in education, we have two goals. One is students acquire the knowledge, and so that's the instruction and all of the activities they engage in, the testing, 
is to look at that knowledge that is acquired. And the second is what I just mentioned a few moments ago, that when they finish a course or a curriculum or a degree, that they can use that knowledge. Okay, they can employ that knowledge. If they graduate in chemistry, can they use that knowledge of chemistry in a f job that requires chemistry knowledge? Not just knowledge, but the ability to advance the field of chemistry. And so we have these two goals. And so when looking at a course, you say, okay, is this course going to help students acquire both the knowledge and the skill to employ that knowledge. We, in the United States, I'm not sure here in Hong Kong, but there was criticism for a long time about college degrees that, okay, you went to college, but then you had, then they go to work, and you'd have to teach what the job really in, involves. And so you say, okay, you're acquiring this knowledge, but now you have to learn how to do something. Okay, so it's important to look at, in a learning environment, that it's not just acquisition, but it's also the ability to employ that knowledge, to elaborate in employment. Uh, looking at objectives, the various kinds of objectives. Uh, during the acquisition of knowledge, uh, that a curriculum should involve learning, and this is hard work, learning the knowledge, learning the information, the skills to use it, the intellectual skills, the problem solving skills, and then the uh, using that, those knowledges in what I have here, complex situations and problems. Uh, and then far as the area of employment so that you can employ this information. This last one here, creativity, should be an important goal of a curriculum, that when students finish a curriculum, not just a course, when they finish the curriculum, they can use that knowledge in a creative way so that we are advancing knowledge. As scientists, we're judged upon our ability to advance knowledge, okay, to finding problems and then finding solutions. And so a curriculum, uh, as you finish a curriculum, whatever that may be in, is that the students are able to engage in creative uh, activities. Okay, one of the important things when de developing instruction is okay, how much time are students going to spend in the acquiring of knowledge and then the use of that knowledge to eventually become creative. And I call this academic learning time. So in putting together a curriculum, say, okay, how much time in a course is going to be devoted to the knowledge acquisition and how much time is going to be devoted where students can use that knowledge for problem solving, decision making. I've participated in a lot of evaluation in a lot of professional schools. And the professional schools were very good at the time spent in learning the information, but they are very poor at using that information. And so various professional schools use various techniques to try to get students, okay, now you've sat in the classroom for four years, now we're gonna send you out, and you're really gonna learn how to become whatever it is, a doctor or a dentist or a lawyer or a professor. Now a lot of you are professors in here, so what do professors do? They go to school for, for a long time, and then they say, okay, you go teach in a classroom. You say, well, how do I teach in a classroom? Well, I'll do it the way I was done, where you just spew out the same stuff. 
And so what we've tried to do in our graduate program is that students, part of their curriculum is to actually teach, get in the classroom and teach, or develop computer-based courses, or so they engage in what a professor really does. A professor does a lot of things. And a very important part of that is teaching. So the academic time, looking at your curriculum, how much time do students get to really learn what they're going to be doing? Okay, this next part is saying, okay, depending upon what your goals in the class, there's different kinds of instructional strategies. Okay, and computing can help, uh, can enhance some of that, th some of those things. Now, it's actually kind of a dichotomous pro Computers are very good at drill and practice. Okay, that's one of the laws of Thorndike was the law of exercise. So you, a student can engage in a lot of uh, drill and practice on particular topics. But they also, and so these objectives dealing with presenting of information practice are well suited for a, a lot of technology-based situations. Now at the other end, and I've done a lot of research myself on simulations and case studies and role playing, technology can play a, a valuable part in those kinds of activities. They're obviously much more difficult to develop, simulations. We also have what new term now is called knowledge games. So put that up in your head, knowledge games. The idea that games are more than just entertainment, but using games as a way of helping students acquire more knowledge. So knowledge games or serious games is another uh, term here under this last one here, uh, simulations and games. Going back to that table, we talked about, okay, different kinds of modes of instruction for the acquisition of knowledge, didactic, uh, tutorial, and then artificial reality is kind of like role playing and, and uh, simulations. And getting an employment of knowledge, virtual, and, and I don't just want to throw out terms now, virtual means they actually try to get them engaging in the process. That kind of completes my presentation, it's kind of the, the time I had here. Thank you.